Hey everyone, I welcome you all to the CICT Phil course by Simply Learn. In this complete course, we will learn everything we need to know about the CICT pipeline in DevOps. We have Mathevs and Anuj to guide us through this journey. We shall begin with understanding the basics of DevOps and have a look at the different aspects of DevOps. After knowing the basics of DevOps, we shall start with the CICD pipeline. In the process, we shall understand what continuous integration and continuous deployment is all about. While learning about the pipeline, we shall learn how is it implemented with the help of a hands-on demo. Moving forth, we shall learn in detail about Jenkins and how to implement the CI-CD pipeline with Jenkins. After we have ample knowledge regarding the CI-CD pipeline, we shall dive a little more and check the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And finally, we shall understand why CI-CD is considered the best DevOps practice. But before we begin, make sure that you have subscribed to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon so that you can never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now, without further ado, let's begin with our introduction. We're going to go through a number of key elements today. The first two will be reviewing models that you're already probably using for delivering solutions into your company. And the most popular one is Waterfall followed by Agile. Then we'll look at DevOps and how DevOps differs from the two models and how it also borrows and leverages the best of those models. We'll go through each of the phases that are used in typical DevOps delivery and then the tools used within those phases to really improve the efficiencies within DevOps. Finally, we'll summarize the advantages that DevOps brings to you and your teams. So let's go through Waterfall. So Waterfall is a traditional delivery model that's been used for many decades for delivering solutions, not just IT solutions and digital solutions, but even way before that. It has its history that goes back to World War II. So Waterfall is a model that is used to capture requirements and then cascade each key deliverable through a series of different stage gates that is used for building out the solution. So let's take you through each of those stage gates. The first that you may have done is requirements analysis. And this is where you sit down with the actual client and you understand specifically what they actually do and what they're looking for in the software that you're going to build. And then from that requirements analysis, you'll build out a project plan. So you have an understanding of what the level of work is needed to be able to be successful in delivering the solution. After that, you've got your plan, then you start doing the development. And that means that the programmers start coding out their solution. They build out their applications, they build out the websites. And this can take weeks or even months to actually do all the work. When you've done your coding and development, then you send it to another group that does testing and they'll do full regression testing of your application against the systems and databases that integrate with your application. You'll test it against uh, the actual code. You'll do manual testing. You do UI testing. And then after you've delivered the solution, you go into maintenance mode, which is just kind of making sure that the application keeps working. If there's any security risks that you address those security risks. So the problem you have, though, is that there are some challenges, however, that you have with the waterfall model. The cascading deliveries and those complete and separated stage gates means that it's very difficult for any new requirements from the client to be integrated into the project. So if a client comes back and it's, the project has been running for six months and they've gone, hey, we need to change something, that means that we have to almost restart the whole project. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. Also, if you spend weeks and months away from your client and you deliver a solution that they are only just going to see after you spend a lot of time working on it, they could be pointing out things that are in the actual final application that they don't want or are not implemented correctly or lead to just general unhappiness. The challenge you then have is if you want to add back in the client's feedback to restart the whole waterfall cycle again. So the client will come back to you with a list of changes and then you go back and you have to start your programming and you have to then start your testing process again. And just you're really adding in lots of additional time into the project. 
So using the waterfall model, companies have soon come to realize that you know the clients just aren't able to get their feedback in quickly, effectively. It's very expensive to make changes once the teams have started working. And the requirement in today's digital world is that solutions simply must be delivered faster. And this has led for a specific change in Agile. And we start implementing the Agile model. So the Agile model allows programmers to create prototypes and get those prototypes to the client with the requirements faster. And the client is able to then send the requirements back to the programmer with feedback. This allows us to create what we call a feedback loop where we're able to get information to the client and the client can get back to the development team much faster. Typically, when we're actually going through this process, we're looking at the engagement cycle being about two weeks. And so it's much faster than the traditional waterfall approach. And so we can look at each feedback loop as comprising of four key elements. We have the planning where we actually sit down with the client and understand what they're looking for. We then have coding and testing that is building out the code and the solution that is needed for the client. And then we review with the client the changes that have happened. But we do all this in a much tighter cycle that we call a sprint. And that typically a sprint will last for about two weeks. Some companies run sprints every week, some run every four weeks. It's up to you as a team to decide how long you want to actually run a sprint. But typically it's two weeks. And so every two weeks, the client is able to provide feedback into that loop. And so you were able to move quickly through iterations. And so if we get to the end of sprint two and the client says, hey, you know what? We need to make a change. You can make those changes quickly and effectively for sprint three. What we have here is a breakdown of the ceremonies and the approach that you bring to Agile. So typically what will happen is that a product leader will build out a backlog of products and what we call a product backlog. And this will be just a whole bunch of different features and they may be small features or bug fixes all the way up to large features that may actually span over multiple sprints. But when you go through the sprint planning, you want to actually break out the work that you're doing. So the team has a mixture of small, medium and large solutions that they can actually implement successfully into their sprint plan. And then once you actually start running your sprint, again, it's a two week activity. You meet every single day to with the actual sprint team to ensure that everybody is staying on track. And if there's any blockers, that those blockers are being addressed effectively and immediately. The goal at the end of the two weeks is to have a deliverable product that you can put in front of the customer and the customer can then do a review. The key advantages you have of running a sprint with Agile is that the client requirements are better understood because the client is really integrated into the Scrum team. They're there all the time. And the product is delivered much faster than with a traditional waterfall model. You're delivering features at the end of each sprint versus waiting weeks, months, or in some cases, years for a waterfall project to be completed. However, there are also some distinct disadvantages. The product itself really doesn't get tested in a production environment. It's only being tested on the developer computers. And it's really hard when you're actually running Agile for the sprint team to actually build out a solution easily and effectively on their computers to mimic the production environment. And the developers and the operations team are running in separate silos. So you have your development team running their sprint and actually working to build out the features. But then when they're done at the end of their sprint and they want to do a release, they kind of fling it over the wall at the operations team. And then it's the operations team job to actually install the software and make sure that the environment is running in a stable fashion. That is really difficult to do when you have the two teams really not working together. So here we have is a breakdown of that process with the developers submitting their work to the operations team for deployment. And then the operations team may submit their work to the production servers. But what if there is an error? What if there was a setup configuration error with the developer's test environment that doesn't match the production environment? There may be a dependency that isn't there. There may be a link to an API that doesn't exist in production. And so you have these challenges that the operations team are constantly faced with. And their challenge is that they don't know how the code works.
So this is where DevOps really comes in. And let's dig into how DevOps, which is developers and operators working together, is the key for successful continuous delivery. So DevOps is as an evolution of the Agile model. The Agile model really is great for gathering requirements and for developing and testing out your solutions. And what we want to be able to do is kind of address that challenge and that gap between the ops team and the dev team. And so with DevOps, what we're doing is bringing together the operations team and the development team into a single team. And they are able to then work more seamlessly together because they are integrated to be able to build out solutions that are being tested in a production like environment so that when we actually deploy, we know that the code itself will work. The operations team is then able to focus on what they're really good at, which is analyzing the production environment and being able to provide feedback to the developers on what is being successful. So we're able to make adjustments in our code that is based on data. So let's step through the different phases of a DevOps team. So typically you'll see that the DevOps team will actually have eight phases. Now this is somewhat similar to Agile. And what I'd like to point out at the time is that again, Agile and DevOps are very closely related, that Agile and DevOps are closely related delivery models that you can use. With DevOps, it's really just extending that model with the key phases that we have here. So let's step through each of these key phases. So the first phase is planning, and this is where we actually sit down with a business team and we go through and understand what their goals are. The second stage is, as you can imagine, and this is where it's all very similar to Agile, is that the coders actually start coding. But they typically, they'll start using tools such as Git, which is a distributed version control software. It makes it easier for developers to all be working on the same code base rather than bits of the code that is rather than them working on bits of the code that they are responsible for. So the goal with using tools such as Git is that each developer always has the current and latest version of the code. You then use tools such as Maven and Gradle as a way to consistently build out your environment. And then we also use tools to actually automate our testing. Now, what's interesting is when we use tools like Selenium and JUnit is that we're moving into a world where our testing is scripted, the same as our build environment and the same as using our Git environment. We can start scripting out these environments. And so we actually have scripted production environments that we're moving towards. Jenkins is the integration phase that we use for our tools. And another point here is that the tools that we're listing here, these are all open source tools. These are tools that any team can start using. We want to have tools that control and manage the deployment of code into the production environments. And then finally, tools such as Ansible and Chef will actually operate and manage those production environments so that when code comes to them, that that code is compliant with the production environment so that when the code is then deployed to the many different production servers, that the expected results of those servers, which is you want them to continue running, is received. And then finally, you monitor the entire environment. So you can actually zero in on spikes and issues that are relevant to either the code or changing consumer habits on the site. So let's step through some of those tools that we have in the DevOps environment. So here we have is a breakdown of the DevOps tools that we have. And again, one of the things I want to point out is that these tools are open source tools. There are also many other tools. This is just really a selection of some of the more popular tools that are being used. But it's quite likely that you're already using some of these tools today. You may already be using Jenkins. You may already be using Git. But some of the other tools really help you create a fully scriptable environment so that you can actually start scripting out your entire DevOps tool set. This really helps when it comes to speeding up your delivery, because the more you can actually script out of the work that you're doing, the more effective you can be at running automation against those scripts, and the more effective you can be at having a consistent experience. So let's step through this DevOps process. So we go through and we have our continuous delivery, which is our plan, code, build, and test environment. 
So what happens if you want to make a release? Well, the first thing you want to do is send out your files to the build environment and you want to be able to test the code that you've been created. Because we're scripting everything in our code from the actual unit testing being done to the uh, all the way through to the production environment, because we're testing all of that, we can very quickly identify whether or not there are any defects within the code. If there are defects, we can send that code right back to the developer with a message saying what the defect is and the developer can then fix that with information that is real on the either the code or the production environment. If, however, your code passes the, the scripting tests, it can then be deployed. And once it's out to deployment, you can then start monitoring that environment. What this provides you is the opportunity to speed up your delivery. So you go from the waterfall model, which is weeks, months, or even years between releases, to agile, which is two weeks or four weeks, depending on your sprint cadence, to where you are today with DevOps, where you can actually be doing multiple releases every single day. So there are some significant advantages and there are companies out there that are really zeroing in on those advantages. If we take any one of these companies, such as Google, Google, any given day, will actually process 50 to 100 new releases on their website through their DevOps teams. In fact, they have some great videos on YouTube that you can find out on how their DevOps teams work. Netflix is also a similar environment. Now, what's interesting with Netflix is that Netflix have really fully embraced DevOps within their development team. And so they have a DevOps team and Netflix is a completely digital company. So they have software on phones, on smart TVs, on computers and on websites. Interestingly, though, the DevOps team for Netflix is only 70 people. And when you consider that a third of all internet traffic on any given day is from Netflix, it's really a reflection on how effective DevOps can be when you can actually manage that entire business with just 70 people. So there are some key advantages that DevOps has. It's the actual time to create and deliver software is dramatically reduced, particularly compared to waterfall. Complexity of maintenance is also reduced because you're automating and scripting out your entire environment. Uh, you're improving the communication between all your teams. So teams don't feel like they're in separate silos, but that are actually working cohesively together and that there is continuous integration and continuous delivery so that your consumer, your customer, is constantly being delighted. Learning Objectives By the end of this lesson, you will be able to describe the importance of continuous integration and continuous deployment, list the features of Jenkins and demonstrate their uses, list the features of Team City and demonstrate their uses, and select a suitable tool for your organization. The Overview and Importance of Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment Overview of Continuous Integration Continuous integration is a development practice of combining code from a number of different developers into a common code base intended for deployment. Each integration event is verified by automated build and automated tests. There are many aspects to a continuous integration, also known as CI, process. Continuous integration is a development practice of combining code from a number of different developers into a common code base intended for deployment. Each integration event is verified by automated build and automated tests. There are many aspects to a continuous integration, also known as CI, process. These are develop and compile code, perform unit tests, integrate code with various types of databases, perform pre-production deployment activities, for example, moving code to various types of computing environments, such as testing and staging. Also, part of a continuous integration process is to perform functional testing and apply labels against release points in the code repository. Additional activities in CI are to generate reports and analyze the code. Continuous integration is about combining code from each developer into a common deployment path automatically with a high degree of accuracy. 
Continuous integration is more than a developer just creating some code and committing it to a feature branch he or she is working on for automation to pick up and deploy. Instead, the developer needs to make sure that he or she writes unit tests that exercise each line of code written. The purpose of unit testing is to prove that the code that's written works to expectation. A standard feature of most shops that practice continuous integration is to have the process run all the unit tests in the developer's work branch before merging the code into a common code base. If the unit tests don't pass in the automated process, the developer's code is not merged into the common branch. Then, the developer is typically notified, either by email or by another communication channel, that there's a problem that needs to be corrected. Overview of Continuous Deployment Continuous deployment is an extension of continuous integration. Its purpose is to reduce the time between a development team writing code and then using it in production. The benefits of continuous deployment are not only that it provides faster feedback from end users as each new feature is released to production, but it also realizes a faster return on investment for each feature as it gets developed. For the most part, continuous deployment is a highly automated process that reduces the need for human interaction in the deployment process. Scripts take over most of the work that used to be done by humans previously involved in the physical deployment of code. Not only does automation copy code from one computing environment to another, the scripts will actually create the computing environments that need to be in place before you can move the code along. Automation reduces the time it takes to get code from developer to end user and increases the accuracy of the code that's being produced. Continuous deployment makes sure that the right code is in the right place at the right time. Popular tools in continuous integration and continuous deployment. The more common CI CD tools used in IT shop practicing DevOps are Jenkins. Travis CI, Bamboo, Team City, and GitLab. Continuous integration with Jenkins. Jenkins is one of the more popular tools in the DevOps landscape. It's a powerful framework that supports a broad plugin ecosystem. Instead of having to write code on a line by line basis to extend the power of Jenkins, developers write custom plugins to add new functionality. These plugins are highly reusable so much so that a whole marketplace has evolved around the product. There are now over a thousand plugins available, and most of these are free. Also, Jenkins integrates with over a hundred other DevOps tools, such as GitHub, and testing tools from a variety of vendors. Jenkins allows DevOps personnel to reliably orchestrate the release tool chain, and it's designed to be an end-to-end -end solution. In order to get full benefit from using Jenkins, aspiring DevOps personnel need to understand the standard phases in the CI-CD pipeline. These phases are code and commit, build and configure, scan and test, release, and deploy. You're going to incorporate a variety of tools with Jenkins during each phase of the process. During code and commit, Developers use an integrated development environment, also known as an IDE, to create code. The popular ones are Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and Eclipse. And then they'll check the code into a version control system such as Get, GitHub, Perforce, or Mercurial. Some code might require binary dependencies that are stored in an artifact repository, such as Artifactory. After code is created and committed, it needs to be built. If the code requires compilation into a binary file, such as a DLL, EXE, or JAR file, Jenkins will use a build system such as MSBuild, a C compiler, Maven for Java, or AND for more general purposes. If the code needs to be containerized, you'll use Docker. Some IT shops will automatically create computing environments during build and configure in anticipation of impending code deployments. Tools such as Puppet, Chef, and Ansible can provision virtual machines automatically according to predefined configurations. 
And during the scan and testing phase, you'll integrate Jenkins with testing tools such as JUnit, JMeter, Cucumber, or MS Test. Front end testing can be conducted using Selenium, Appium, Sauce Lab, or Hewlett Packard products. The purpose of scan and test is to make sure the code meets quality standards and is safe to move forward in the CI CD process. The release phase is the last stage before code is released to users. You might integrate Jenkins with tools such as uDeploy, Serena, MidVision, or Excel Release. Finally, for deploy, you'll go on premises to a cloud service or a hybrid combination of both a private on premises cloud and a public cloud. For public cloud deployments, you'll target Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Azure, or IBM Cloud. Also, we're seeing cloud orchestration technologies such as Kubernetes take an increased presence as a release platform. For a private cloud, there's OpenStack. If you're working directly with virtual machines, you'll integrate Jenkins with VMware products or Docker. At a high level, in terms of application runtimes, you'll need something like the JBoss Java Virtual Machine or the WebSphere application server. Jenkins provides operational consistency in the various stages of release, regardless of the particular products you plan to use. Thus, you'll do well to keep these phases of deployment in mind as you continue on your journey to DevOps mastery. Continuous deployment with Jenkins. As you can see in the slide, continuous deployment, which we abbreviate as CD, consists of five operational stages. The first stage is coding, which is typically done on the developer's local workstation. The next stage is storage. During the storage phase, a developer commits his or her code to a source control management system such as GET, moving the code into a separate test computing environment, ensuring that the code is implemented in the best way possible, in addition to ensuring that the code works according to expectation so that it can be released to production is done in the quality assurance and testing stages. Production is the final stage in the release process. Production is where the code is made available to end users. The value that Jenkins brings to the software development lifecycle is that it can be configured to automate every stage of the entire process. This is very important because it not only speeds up the software development process overall, but also increases the accuracy and reliability of the code under development. Companies such as LinkedIn, Google, and Facebook have made continuous deployment a fundamental part of the way they make software. It's only by using an automation tool such as Jenkins that effective continuous deployment is possible. Doing deployment manually is time consuming and costly. Those who adhere to the principles of DevOps understand that continuous deployment is an essential part of the practice of software development in the modern enterprise, and automation is key to the practice. Continuous integration with Team City. Team City is a free continuous integration tool from JetBrains. The company is best known for its integrated development environments for writing software. The abbreviation for integrated development environment is IDE. Team City is a complete continuous deployment, continuous integration system designed to automatically manage all aspects of the software development lifecycle. Team City is designed to integrate with all the popular products used in modern software development. It integrates well with the standard web browsers. As we've learned previously, communication among and between teams is important. Thus, Team City can be configured to send out notifications using email, RSS, chat tools, and social media platforms such as Slack. It supports version control by integrating with source control management systems such as Get. Subversion, Perforce, as well as many others. Team City supports all the build tools and development frameworks commonly found in the enterprise, such as Ant, Maven, MS Build, and Grunt. 
Also, Team City can be integrated with popular IDEs such as Eclipse, the various JetBrain tools such as IntelliJ, WebStorm, and PyCharm. Team City also integrates easily with the industry standard for developing Microsoft technologies, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Continuous deployment with Team City. A good way to understand the workflow that Team City is designed to manage by way of automation is to conceptualize the software development process as having three areas of activity artifact, deployment, and operations. Let's take a look at each area in detail. Artifact activity is about managing the various code components that make up a software system. Some shops use the term deployment unit to describe the distinct component of code that needs to be released into production. Other shops use the term deployment artifact. Some of these components might be a binary file, such as Java, or a JAR file, or in .NET shops, the artifacts can be an .exe or a .dll file. Linux doesn't have the concept of file extension-based executables. Thus, any file can be an executable. You just need to have the right permission set. The important thing to understand about the artifact area is that it's about creating and managing deployment units that will be released to production. Deployment. Once an artifact or a collection of artifacts are ready for release, they need to go through a company's deployment process. There are a number of tools and processes associated with deployment activity. The ultimate goal of the deployment activity is to make sure that working valuable software gets to the customer as quickly as possible. Typically, companies will use a ticketing system to control and monitor the work that needs to be done in deployment. Artifacts will be prepared for deployment. Computing instances will be provisioned. Sometimes the provisioning might involve creating virtual computing instances such as a virtual machine or a container. Other times, it might require installing physical hardware, such as computers and networking devices. Then, after provisioning is complete, the deployment artifacts are configured and pushed into relevant computing environments. And finally, we get to operations. It's important to understand that a comprehensive CI-CD system, such as Team City, goes beyond just deployment activity. Team City will also automate a lot of operations activity. Release personnel can use Team City features to orchestrate computing environments and monitor activity in those environments. Also, it coordinates important aspects of enterprise level DevOps, such as logging and aggregating security alerts. Security is a critical aspect of any enterprise's operation and is of particular concern to any DevOps practitioner working within the enterprise. Overview and Features of Jenkins Jenkins as a Continuous Integration Tool Jenkins is a Java-based open-source automation tool. It functions as a server and is a software development and cross-platform tool used for continuous integration and continuous deployment. Let's look at what Jenkins can do. As a continuous integration server, it can be used as a CI server or a continuous delivery hub for a project. In terms of distribution, it can easily distribute work across different machines and help trigger builds, tests, and deployments to multiple machines and platforms quickly. Jenkins is designed to work cross-platform. It allows programming in software development environments such as iOS, .NET, Android, Ruby, and Java. Architecture of Jenkins Jenkins is a comprehensive CI-CD framework that is designed to be flexible and extensible. It has a distinct object model that has classes like project and build. These classes describe the various components of the framework. It uses Jelly as the view technology. It uses the file system to store its data. Directories are created at the location on disk defined by the environmental variable Jenkins underscore home. 
It supports plugins, which are plugged into those extension points and extend the capabilities of Jenkins. Popular features of Jenkins. Let's take a look at the features. One, Jenkins is platform independent. Two, it has a rich plugin system. Three, it has the support of a large community of third-party developers and expert users. Four, it's designed to scale to meet the needs of the large enterprise. Five, its automation capabilities enable immediate detection and resolution of issues. Six, it's open source and user-friendly. And seven, it's easy to configure, modify, and extend. Build status and job health. Every time a Jenkins job runs, the status of the build gets reported. The figure on the left side of the slide shows the results of a few runs of a build project. Notice that the result of each build is reported. Sometimes the build succeeds. Other times it fails. If an administrator aborts or disables the build, that gets reported too. The figure on the right side of the slide provides a description of the overall health of the project according to many builds. Assisted Practice Set up Jenkins Let's take a look at the Assisted Practice. You are given a project to install and configure Jenkins on the Ubuntu operating system of your Learning Lab virtual machine. Lab 3.1 Installing and Configuring Jenkins. In this demo, we're going to describe three steps to install and configure Jenkins. First, we're going to modify the file sources.list. Then we're going to use apt-get to install the Jenkins package. And then finally, we're going to run Jenkins in the browser. So let's get started. First, at the command line, we type make dir lab 3.1. Then, at the command line, we type cd lab 3.1 to navigate into the directory we've just created. Now, we need to add the key from the Jenkins package repository into our local environment. At the command line, we type wget dash q dash o https colon slash slash package dot jenkins dot io slash debian dash stable slash jenkins dot io dash key pipe sudo apt dash key add dash and this will add the key directly into the apt get file system. Now we need to update the file sources.list. We'll use the Vi editor that's already installed in your classroom virtual machine. At the command line, we type sudo space vi space forward slash etc forward slash apt forward slash sources dot list. Sources.list is the file that apt-get uses to locate package repositories on the internet. We strike the I key on the keyboard to put Vi into insert mode. We scroll down to an empty space in Vi and type deb https colon forward slash forward slash pkg.jenkins.io forward slash Debian dash stable space binary forward slash. Then we hit the escape key to get out of insert mode and type colon W for write Q to quit Vi. Now we have to update the package manager. At the command line, we type sudo apt dash get space update. Update executes. Once we see the line reading package lists dot 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 done, the update is complete. 
Now we need to see if Java is installed, and if not, we need to install it. At the command line, we type Java space dash version. As you can see, Java and the Java Development Kit is already installed. If Java was not installed, you would type sudo space apt-get space install space openjdk-7 dash j j r e this command will execute app get to install the open jdk package now we install jenkins type sudo space app dash get space install space jenkins strike the y key to confirm installation the installation process will take a few seconds. Now we're going to open the initial installation of Jenkins in a browser. We go back to the virtual machine desktop. In this case, we'll load the Firefox browser. We're going to enter the IP address of the Jenkins installation. The IP address was assigned to the virtual machine earlier. In the address bar of the Firefox browser, we enter the IP address 172.31.26.234 colon 8080. 8080 is the port where the Jenkins server is running. Please be advised, the IP address of your virtual machine will be different. And the way you can discover the IP address is at the command line type ifconfig. The IP address of your virtual machine will be in the information displayed. The first screen we're shown is the Unlock Jenkins screen. We're going to need to enter the administrator password in order to continue. As you can see in the red type, the location of the password is a file slash var slash live slash Jenkins slash secrets slash initial admin password. Where initial admin password is the name of the file that contains the password. We return to the terminal. We type clear to clear the screen. At the command line, we type sudo space cat space forward slash var forward slash lib forward slash Jenkins forward slash secrets forward slash initial admin password. We strike the enter key to display the password. We highlight the password in the terminal and then copy it by right clicking on the mouse and selecting copy. We return to the browser and paste the password into the administrator password text box. Then we click the continue button. Firefox will offer to save the password, but we'll click Don't Save. We have the option to install suggested plugins, or we can select specific plugins to install. We're going to go with the Install Suggested Plugins method. We click the box labeled Install Suggested Plugins. The Getting Started page appears and the plugin installation continues. Once downloading and installing the plugins is complete, you'll be presented with the Create First Admin User page. At this point, we've successfully installed Jenkins. Now, the next steps will be to create the admin user by putting in a username, password, confirmation of password, a full name for the user, and the user's email address. 
Let's recap the important steps. Assisted practice guidelines to install and configure Jenkins. Log in to your Ubuntu lab provided with the course. Open the terminal and execute the command available in the lab document 3.1 to add the key to the system. Edit the sources.list file and add the command to the file and then save it. Update the apt-get package. Install JDK 8 plus version. Install Jenkins using apt-get package. Navigate to the IP address of the machine denoted as x.x.x.x.8080 in the browser of your virtual machine. Get the password and enter it into the Jenkins window. Create a new role job in Jenkins. Explore the freestyle project and build section. Overview and the features of Team City. Team City as a continuous integration tool. Team City is a Java-based management and continuous integration server. It's licensed commercial software that's used for continuous integration and continuous deployment. Team City supports a number of features that are important to the continuous integration process. For example, gated commits ensure only working code is committed to deployment branches and source control. Team City supports integration with various integrated development environments, such as Eclipse and IntelliJ. It has a build grid that describes build activity. Also, it has cross platform support for a variety of operating systems and programming languages. Also, Team City has seamless code integration. Team City Workflow. Team City supports the CI CD process that has become the standard workflow for many companies and software development shops. Let's take a look at the overall workflow. As you can see in the slide at point one, the first step is that a developer or tester checks code in to the source control management system. Upon commit at point two, a build trigger message is sent to the Team City server. Then at point three, Team City works with system unit testing to start the system unit testing automation process. If the code passes the test, artifact building, archiving, and deployment tasks are performed in an automated manner at point four. Team City reports the status of all the activities at point five. Popular features of Team City. Team City has many features that make the CI CD process more efficient. Let's take a look at the features. Team City has pre tested commit, instant notifications, it has code coverage and monitoring capabilities, it provides a comprehensive build infrastructure, and it has enhanced version control system integration. Team City makes it easy to verify code, and it offers configurable test reports. And finally, Team City supports managing users and roles. Assisted practice. Set up Team City. Now it's time to do an assisted practice to set up Team City. You're going to be given a project to install and configure Team City on the Ubuntu operating system in your Learning Lab virtual machine. So let's get started with Lab 3.2 Install and Configure Team City. First, we create a directory for the work. We type mkdir lab 3.2. Then we navigate to that directory by typing cd space lab 3.2. First, we're going to download the compressed gz file for Team City. Then we're going to extract the files from the compressed file. We're going to move the extracted directory that contains the files into another location. We're going to start up Team City. And then we're going to go to the browser and register a user with Team City. Let's download Team City. We go to the desktop 
of our classroom virtual machine and then we click on the icon for Google Chrome. Chrome appears. In the Chrome address bar we type www.jetbrains.com forward slash team city forward slash download. We click the download button. The GZ file downloads and the thank you page appears. We return to the terminal. At the command line we type cd space forward slash home forward slash ubuntu forward slash capital downloads forward slash. We strike the enter key. This takes us to the directory where the GZ file has been downloaded. At the command line we type ls to confirm that the GZ file is indeed in the directory. Notice the file teamcity-2018.2.1.tar.gz is listed. Now we need to extract the files. At the command line we type tar space zxvf space teamcity-2018.2.1 dot one dot tar dot gz and we hit the enter key. This will extract all the files into a directory named team city. Now we need to move the directory team city into the directory forward slash opt forward slash jet brains. We create a directory by typing sudo space mkdir space forward slash opt forward slash capital jet capital brains. Now we need to move the directory team city into the directory forward slash opt forward slash jet brains. At the command line we type sudo space mv space team city space forward slash opt forward slash jet brains forward slash team city. We strike the enter key. Now we need to give full read, write, and execute permissions to the files in the newly created directory team city. At the command line we type cd space forward slash opt forward slash jet brains. We strike the enter key. Then we type chmod space dash capital R 777 team city forward slash. This says to give all rights to the directory and the contents of the directory Team City. We type ls just to make sure the directory Team City is indeed there. We type cd space Team City forward slash and hit the enter key to enter the directory Team City. Then we type ls to take a look at the contents of the directory Team City. Notice there is a bin directory. We navigate into the bin directory by typing cd space bin and hit the enter key. Let's clear the screen to make things easier to see. To invoke Team City, we will execute the bash file dot forward slash team city dash server dot sh space start. It's very important that you use the dot forward slash characters. 
We hit the enter key and Team City starts up, spawning Team City and then Team City Restarter running with PID 11618. And the PID, the process identifier, will vary according to systems. Now Team City is running. We go back to the browser. But before we do, take notice of the IP address of the virtual machine, which is shown on the command line on the left hand side. The IP address of this virtual machine is 172.31. Dot two six dot two three four. In the address bar of the Chrome browser, we type one seven two dot three one dot two six dot two three four colon eight one one one, which is the port on the IP address where Team City is running. The Team City First Start web page appears. We click the Proceed button. The Team City is Starting page appears. Then we see the Database Connection Setup page. Team City allows you to choose from a variety of databases. We can use Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, or MS SQL Server. We're going to use the internal database. Team City creates the database and initializes its server components. This phase of the setup can take a few minutes. The page will reload automatically once Team City is through installing its server components. We're almost done with Team City's installation process. Then all we'll need to do is to create an account in Team City. When the installation process is complete, we'll be presented with the licensing agreement that we have to agree to. We scroll to the end of the terms and conditions we click the checkbox for Accept License Agreement. We're going to uncheck Send Anonymous Usage Statistics. Then we'll click the Continue button. The web page Create Administrator Account appears. We enter the username Simply Learn. Then we add a password and confirm the password. Finally, we click the button Create Account. We'll also save the username and password information in Google Chrome. Upon successfully entering a username and password, we'll be presented with the My Settings and Tools web page in Team City. The page allows us to access projects and changes and agents as well as build queues. In the next demo, we'll look at more details. Let's recap the important steps. Guidelines to install and configure Team City. Number one, log in to your Ubuntu lab provided with the course. Number two, download Team City from the official site. Three, unzip the folder and install Team City. Four, provide the read, write, and execute mode access to Team City. Number five, Run Team City at x.x.x.x colon eight one one one, where x.x.x.x is the IP address of your local machine or the machine where the server is running. Six, create an account in Team City and add the basic details to complete the setup process. Seven, explore options such as projects, changes, agents, and build queue. Build tools and their uses.
Build Tools. Build Tools are programs that automate the creation of applications from source code. Automation tools allow the build process to be more consistent. Some common build tools are Make, Bash, which ships with Linux, Ant, Apache Maven for Java, Grunt, and Gulp. Popular features of build tools. Well, we can start with compiling to binary code for languages such as C Sharp and Java. Build tools will package a compiled program for deployment. Also, it will run automated test cases against the code. The build tool will deploy artifacts to production and will also generate documents for developers to use for later reference. And finally, a build tool will generate release notes. An overview of Apache Ant. Apache Ant is a Java library and command line tool. Its aim is to provide processes described in build files as targets and extension points dependent on each other. Let's take a look at some of the distinct features. Apache Ant supplies a number of built-in tasks that allow it to compile, test, and run code. It's flexible and does not impose coding conventions. It builds solutions by combining build tools and dependencies with Apache Ivy. It solves makes portability problem. And users can develop custom Ant libs using Java. And finally, you can use Ant to pilot any type of process. The limitations of Apache Ant. In Apache Ant, there are a few limitations. Some of the limitations are, number one, configuration error checking is limited. Undefined properties are not raised as errors, but are left as unexpanded references. Number two, Ant has limited fault handling rules. Lazy property evaluation is not supported. Thus, you need to be very exact when configuring Ant. It is not a forgiving environment. Number three, older tasks use default values, which are not consistent and can cause problems. You need to pay attention. Changing defaults can break existing Ant scripts. And finally, number four, Ant build files are complex and verbose, as they are hierarchical and partly ordered. An overview of Maven. Apache Maven is a comprehensive software project management tool. Based on the project object model, also known as the POM, Maven can manage a project's build, reporting, and documentation from a central XML file. Let's take a look at the key points of Maven. Number one is backward compatibility and auto parent versioning. The hierarchical structure of the POM XML file reduces the burden on version control and reconciliation of dependencies. Number two, Maven supports model-based builds. Number three, Maven supports parallel builds and better error integrity reporting. You can kick off a number of project builds that run asynchronously. Number four, release management and distribution publication is built into Maven. The project object model is comprehensive and covers all aspects of the software development lifecycle from development through testing and on to release. Number five, instant access to the latest features with less or no additional configuration. Maven allows artifact version control that can be set to get the latest release of a dependency. Thus, you can make sure the code is always up to date. Six, large and growing repositories. There is a complete ecosystem of Maven artifact repositories that make it so you have access to popular components automatically. The Maven repository, found at https slash slash mavenrepository.com, is a popular one. Also, a company can set up its own private repository. The drawbacks of Maven. Maven does have some drawbacks. Number one, unable to depend on outcome status. Maven builds can fail, leaving nothing behind other than error messages that can be very hard to understand. Number two, Maven is verbose and complex. It does take a while to master the details of the platform. Number three, 
slow and partial black box. Maven does a lot of things automatically, and sometimes these black box activities can be very opaque. And finally, number four, Maven can be unreliable when integrated for use within the Eclipse IDE. Comparing Maven over Ant. Well, Maven has better dependency management. It provides more powerful builds. There's better collaboration, and the debugging capabilities are a bit better than Ant. There's more componentization in the builds, and there's reduced duplication. And finally, the POM provides a more consistent project structure. The project object model, also known as the POM. The project object model is an XML representation of a Maven project. It provides general configuration information, such as a project's name, its owner, and its dependencies on other projects. The XML excerpt in the slide shows a rudimentary implementation of Maven's project object model. The POM XML needs to define the group ID, the artifact ID, and version. The packaging needs to be declared too. The default deployment package is ajar. The project described in the XML file in the slide has an artifact ID of calculator. You can think of the artifact ID as the name of the artifact that's going to be created. The POM shows a version of 1.0 and it belongs to the group with the identifier eu.totaleclipse. You can think of the group ID as a way a company organizes a number of artifacts under a common name. Overview of Grunt. Grunt is a JavaScript-based task runner which is used to automate repetitive tasks in a workflow. It can be used as a command line tool for JavaScript objects. Let's take a look at some of the key points to understand about Grunt. In Grunt, developers write Grunt setup files to ease workflow. Thus, Grunt speeds up the development flow and enhances performance. It helps with the automation of repetitive tasks with less effort. It supports a small infrastructure, which is a best fit for new code bases. Grunt minifies files such as HTML and CSS, thus reducing the potential problems with network latency. Grunt aims at reducing the chances of errors during repetitive tasks, and it includes built-in tasks to extend functionality of plugins. Currently, Grunt has over 4,000 plugins and can be used in large production sites. An overview of Gulp. Gulp is an open source JavaScript toolkit used as a build system in front end web development. It automates time consuming and repetitive tasks involved in development. Some of the key features of Grunt are code minification and concatenation, usage of pure JavaScript code. Grunt converts files created under LESS or SAS in a CSS compilation process. LESS, which stands for Leaner Style Sheets, is a dynamic preprocessor style sheet language that can be compiled into cascading style sheets, also known as CSS. And these style sheets are run on the client side or the server side. SAS is a preprocessor scripting language that is interpreted or compiled into cascading style sheets. Grunt also manages file manipulation in memory. Some of the advantages of Grunt are that it's easy to code, it's easy to test with web apps, and the plugins are simple to use. Some of the disadvantages of Grunt are there's more than the usual number of dependencies, multiple tasks cannot be performed in parallel, and configuration can become tedious. Assisted practice, continuous integration with Jenkins and Maven. You are given a project to configure in Jenkins. You need to make Jenkins poll get commits and build the project code using Maven on the Ubuntu operating system on your Practice Lab VM. Okay, so let's get started with Lab 3.3, Continuous Integration with Jenkins, Git, and Maven. In this lab, 
we're going to configure Jenkins to support Get and Maven. Then we're going to configure a Maven project. And then finally, we're going to build the Maven project using source code from Get. So in a web browser, we open Jenkins, and what we do in our classroom virtual machine is we go to the IP address, and in this case, it's 172.31.26.234 colon 8080, and Jenkins typically runs by default installation. We click the new item link, which is on the upper left of the Jenkins web page. The new item web page appears. In the new project text box, we enter the project name, in this case, Java Maven. Then we select Freestyle Project, then scroll down the web, then scroll down the web page and click the OK button on the left hand side. The web page for the newly created project loads. We add text to the description text box. This is a simple project to test Jenkins. We go to the menu bar at the top of the project's web page and we click the Build tab. We're taken to the Build section of the web page. We click the Add Build Step button to display a drop down of options. From that drop down list, we select the item Execute Shell. In the command text box, we enter the Linux command echo space quotation mark hello space from space Jenkins quotation. We click the save button on the lower left. Now we'll do a test build to make sure everything's working all right. On the left hand side of the project web page, we click the link build now. The build starts, and when it completes, you'll see a blue circular icon in the Build History section of the project web page on the left side. And you can see there's a build there, and it's labeled number one. To the right of build number one is a drop down arrow, which we click to get a list of options, and we select Console Output. Selecting console output will display in the web page the build log activity. Notice there's a line that says, hello Jenkins. This is from the echo command we entered in the Jenkins build configuration. Let's develop the project a little more. What we need to do is to add get integration and get the project to work with Maven. We go to the Simply Learn site on GitHub, and that's Simply Learn DevOps Official. And we go to the repository Java Maven App. On the GitHub site, we click the green Clone or Download button to display the URL that we can use to access, to access the Java Maven App repository on GitHub. So, we highlight the URL and copy it. We go back to the Jenkins web page. In the Jenkins web page, on the menu bar, we click the tab for the Java Maven project. The Java Maven project appears. On the left side of the project's web page, we click the configure hyperlink. This loads the project's configuration page in which we click the Source Code Management tab. We're navigated to the Source Code Management section of the configuration page. There, we click the option Git. We paste the URL of our Simply Learn Java Maven app repository into the text box repository URL. Entering a valid URL will make the error message, please enter get repository, disappear. We're going to select some predefined credentials from the credentials dropdown. We added those earlier, but if you need to add credentials in the future, simply click the add button and then select 
Jenkins. Now, if you're using your own GitHub repository, you'll be presented with the Jenkins Credentials Provider dialog. You're going to need to enter your username and also your password. Once we configure access to the Get Repository, we click the Save button. Now, what we've done is we've effectively given Jenkins the right to access our GitHub account using our credentials. In other words, Jenkins is impersonating us. After we save the Get configuration, we'll be brought back to the Projects page. We need to go back to Jenkins Home. We click the Jenkins tab on the upper left of the project page. This takes us back to the main Jenkins dashboard page, which we can think of as home. Now we click Manage Jenkins on the left side of the Jenkins home page. On the Manage Jenkins page, we select Global Tool Configuration. The Global Tool Configuration page appears. We scroll down to the Maven section of the Global Tool Configuration page. We click on the button Add Maven to add a Maven configuration. We're going to give this installation a name and we're going to call it Local Maven. Then Maven needs to know where its home is on the Classroom Virtual Machine. In the text box labeled Maven underscore home, we enter the value slash USR slash share slash Maven. An alternative method is to again click on Add Maven, add a name, this time Maven, and then from the Install from Apache dropdown, select the version of Maven that's on the machine. We've now let Jenkins know about Maven, so we can click the Save button. We return to the Manage Jenkins page. We need to return to the project. In the upper left-hand corner of the Manage Jenkins page, we click the Jenkins button. We're brought back to the Jenkins main dashboard. You can see Java Maven in the list of projects on the main dashboard. When we hover over Java Maven, we'll see a down arrow. We click that down arrow and some options appear we select Configure from the Options dropdown. The Java Maven Projects Configuration page appears. We click the Build tab in the menu bar. You can see the echo command that we created previously in the Build section. We want to get rid of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the right side of the Execute Shell section and click the red button with the X label. Clicking the red button deletes the execute shell command echo from the build section. Now we want to add a new build step. We click the add build step button and we notice that another drop down appears. From that drop down we select invoke top level Maven targets. After we add the Maven build task, we'll be presented with a Maven version drop down. This will contain the Maven configurations we created previously. We select one of the configurations. In this case, we'll select Maven. Let's recap the important steps. Assisted practice, guidelines to configure Jenkins and Maven. Number one, log in to Ubuntu Lab provided with the course. Number two, log into Jenkins and create the first Jenkins job. Number three, install and configure Maven. Number four, configure Jenkins with Java, Get, and Maven. Number five, create a Jenkins job for your Maven build project and run the project. Number six, pull Get for commits and automatically trigger the build. Number seven, build a trigger using the push mechanism instead of pull. Number eight, repeat steps six and seven multiple times to observe the results in the console output section. Now, when we know the definition of both continuous delivery and continuous deployment, let's see the contrast between the two.
we have drawn the contrast between the two on the basis of three major factors. The three major factors are the definition of the two advantages that they both have and for whom or what kind of organizations use them. Let's begin with the first factor. The first factor we have is the definition. Continuous delivery is a DevOps practice that looks forward towards releasing the code changes to the production after all the testing has been performed. Whereas continuous deployment is a DevOps practice that focuses on continuously deploying or releasing the code changes into the production environment. Then the second factor is advantages. Here we will see the advantages of the two. Continuous delivery is known for frequent releases while continuous deployment is known for completion of each deployment phase. Second advantage is continuous delivery is known to complete the releases in smaller segments while continuous deployment is known for quick and more reliable completion. The next advantage in our list is continuous delivery is known for its instant response to defects and bugs whereas continuous deployment focuses on automating the entire process. The final advantage of continuous delivery is that it is known for its comfortable, stable and very reliable releases. Whereas continuous deployment is popular for the creation of fully automated CI CD pipeline. The third considerable factor is for whom. In this factor, we will see what kind of organizations or companies use these two practices. Continuous delivery is used by organizations that need to release new features on a frequent schedule. On the other hand, continuous deployment is mainly used by organizations that look forward to releases on a daily or hourly basis. The process of continuous deployment ensures cross-department coordination like development, support, marketing business, etc. Now, when we know continuous integration, continuous delivery and continuous deployment, it is important for us to understand how these three are related to each other. In the diagram on the screen, we can see the process of integration, delivery and deployment in a simultaneous flow. We can see that first the build is initiated, which is then tested and in the next step it is merged. These three steps together make continuous integration. Then after these three steps comes the next phase, where the automatic release to the repository takes place. And this is called the continuous delivery phase. Lastly. The release reaches the phase where it is continuously released to the production and this step is known as the continuous deployment phase. Now to understand these better, we shall see each of these phases one by one to understand their relation with the CI-CD pipeline. The first phase in the CI-CD pipeline is the continuous integration phase. The process refers to the integration of all the code changes into a shared repository continuously. The process of continuous integration ensures that this code is tested and incorporated very smoothly. After the integration phase comes the continuous delivery phase. As the name implies, the phase looks forward to delivering the changes being made in the code after several iterations and feedbacks. In the continuous delivery phase, the team finalizes what is to be deployed to the customers and when. After the delivery phase comes the last phase that is the continuous deployment phase. Continuous deployment phase is the phase that is completely free from human interference. There is a common goal that continuous delivery and continuous deployment share. That goal is to automate the entire development process. These phases are sometimes combined to each other to give the maximum productivity. Now let's talk about that why exactly as and we talk about at the industry level and the market level also that the CICD is one of the best practices. Now what is the reason behind that? Why those are known as the best development and DevOps practices as such? Now continuous integration and continuous delivery are the best practices as they create an effective process. The kind of integration and delivering the source code, these are the prime things which we need to take care when we talk about the development uh, teams over here. So they want an automated process. First of all, 
and they also want a streamlined process which can you know take up the things uh, which should not fail it should be a fail safe process mechanism through which they can release various kind of changes to the production environment because ultimately they are looking forward for the deployment of the changes to the production environment so how they are going to do that that is where the ci cd or the continuous integration and continuous delivery helps on that part and that's the reason why they can help the teams the development teams to go for an effective process implementations when we go for these implementations of these two practices small core changes can be easily made in the software code so you don't require much of the efforts if you are going for even small changes in the source code that can also be effectively deployed to a production environment in a simple straightforward and easy mechanism the changes can go from the developer machines to the production environment that's the biggest benefit which we get due to which we feel that yes these two processes should be implemented into a devops platform right so ci and cd provides continuous feedback from the customers and also from the development teams the devops teams so the increase of transparency is also something which is important which is implemented with these processes here so the process enables faster release of the product so we don't have to wait for months to release the source code there within couple of hours within couple of days we can actually release it to the production environment provided we do all these steps like build compilations testing development uh, validation all these things will be done in that duration of time so the failures can be easily detected faster and uh, we can easily find out that what is the problem with the code base what is the problem with the changes and we can even do the hot fixes now hot fixes these kind of uh, ad hoc changes are also can be easily deployed to the production environment within just a couple of hours there now with that we have come to an end on this cicd fill course by simply learn if you have any queries regarding the topics covered in this particular tutorial or if you are looking for the code document which has been implemented in this particular tutorial then please feel free to reach us down in the comment section below and our team of experts will be happy to resolve all your queries until next time thank you stay 